Let's hear what the Spirit is saying to the church, as found in the Gospel of Matthew. That's when the Pharisees plotted a way to trap him into saying something damaging. They sent their disciples, along with few of Herod's followers mixed in, to ask, Teacher, we know you have the integrity. Teach the way of God accurately and are indifferent to popular opinion. Don't pander to your students. So tell us honestly, is it right to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Jesus knew they were up to no good. He said, why are you playing these games with me? Why are you trying to trap me? Do you have a coin? Let me see it. And they handed him a silver piece. This engraving, who does it look like? Whose name is on it? And they said, Caesar. Then give Caesar what is his and give God what is his. And the Pharisees were speechless. They went off shaking their heads. Let's pray. O gracious God, shepherd the words of my mouth and the thoughts and meditations in each of our hearts, that they may grow pleasing in your sight and transformative to our spirits. O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Where do we find it easy to see the image of God? Where do we find it difficult to see the image of God? And how do we navigate this rocky river between faith and politics? All of this is wrapped up in today's reading. This is a direct continuation of the readings that we've been doing over the past few weeks. So Jesus is still sitting in the courts of the temple, still teaching or trying to teach, being interrupted by those who would uh, have him explain exactly where he got his curriculum, exactly where what is on his CV, and this is important for an aspect in this particular piece. Yes, it's easy to see why it would be considered a trap to ask a preacher, should we pay taxes or not? Just as, as now, as then, so there is a difficult relationship between church and state. There there was the difficulty of the religion of the land, Judea, being in direct conflict with the religion of the overarching empire. And that was a religion, a, uh, a difference, a difficulty that could not be easily navigated. It was not something that philosophers could sit down and say, well, okay, this is the easy way through it. Because on the coins themselves, the image of Caesar with the words, Most High, Priest of the Most High, Son of God, Tiberius Caesar. A direct affront to the Jewish understanding that there is one God and it ain't me, it ain't you either. But also within this, Jesus was in the temple courts. And within the temple courts, there was only one currency that was proper, that was holy. That's why just a day before these readings, Jesus had turned over the temple, the tables of the money changers because people had to exchange whatever currency they had for the shekel, the one piece of currency that was authorized, that was holy, that was pure enough for use within the temple. So when people ask, 
about paying taxes, and Jesus says, well, show me a coin that you use to pay taxes. And one of those good church folks pulls out a coin of the empire. They are showing that they are colluding with the empire in ways that they had not thought of. Because that coin should not be there. It's been a rather easy thing for us to divide the world into that which is Caesar's and that which is God's, or at least for us to try to. But even that wasn't Matthew's point in this. It wasn't Jesus' point in showing this. Yes, the coin has the image of Caesar. But what image does Caesar bear? If we are to claim that we are all made in the image of God from the very beginning, if we all have that holy wind-breath spirit within us which animates us all, which is the ground of our being, then yes, the coin may have the image of Caesar, but Caesar bears the image of God, however much he may pile stuff on top of it. And I can think of some Caesars that we've had in this land, which it has been very difficult for me to see the image of God in. I won't embarrass you by sharing my list if you don't share yours. We can think of institutions and organizations which likewise we struggle to see the image of God. We wonder where is God moving in this? Perhaps we might even think of the Hebrew Scripture lesson for today, which didn't get read, but was alluded to in our call to worship. When Moses was having another one of his temper tantrums with the children of Israel and saying, God, I don't know if I can do this anymore. I need something deeper than just a voice out of the wilderness. I need to see you. And frankly, I think every pastor that I've ever met has been able to have a deep resonance with that. Many of the folks that I encounter need something a little bit deeper than just words on a page or words out of somebody's mouth. We need the experience. And God says, well, I can't let you see my face, but I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll set you in a place where you'll be safe. My hand will be over you, and when the danger is past, you will see a bit of me. And God did what he said. God walked past the cleft in the rocks. When he lifted his hands, Moses looked up and was able to see God's backside walking away. With some of the institutions and some of the people, it's easier to see God's backside than God's face. Or sometimes it's easier to hear God's silence than God's word. One of my favorite Christian authors talks about an experience he had growing up in the South where he was apprenticing unofficially with a sal an insurance salesman in the town. And they went down, crossed the tracks, into the poor side of town to pay off a life insurance policy. And as the family was gathered around the coffin of the patriarch of the family, that insurance salesman said, Now, Ms. Mavis, I know that you're having troubles right now. And I know that you could really put all of this money, these hundred dollars out of this life insurance to good use 
But I want you to think about what your family would be going through if you were to go to and you didn't have a policy. And that man strong-armed this widow over the body of her husband into buying a life insurance policy. Left 120 on the casket and walked away with papers in hand. The pastor who wrote about this said he struggled with what happened and where was God speaking in those moments. And he asked the insurance salesman, why were we so insistent on getting that policy today? Couldn't it have been done another day? Couldn't it have been done another way? And the old man said, oh, hell, you know those people. They just spend their money on nothing and there wouldn't be anything left next week you know how those people are and so the boy who would eventually become a pastor as he struggled with that understood that sometimes the voice of God is the silence of God bearing judgment against what has just happened Sometimes that is the way that we understand what goes on within our organizations and institutions. The silence of God is the judgment of God. And sometimes the silence of God is the waiting of God. The waiting for God, of God, for us to do something better. There is no way to separate faith and politics because politics is all about how we interact with each other as people. That's why it's at the root of words that bind us together or that look over our communities. Policy and policemen, polite. It's also that binding. We see that within the word religion, that which binds us to something better and binds us within ourselves, ligio. These are the questions that we navigate. While none of us really enjoys paying taxes, although I was more enthused about paying my water bill after traveling to countries where I couldn't drink out of the faucet and was reminded, oh yes, this is one of the things that I get out of paying my water bill. We are called to question what our government does with the money that we send the money that is sent off. And we are called to ask, how do we respond in faith to questions of where this money is going and how it is being spent and what is going on here at all? The questions of should we obey God or humans is a question that is always before us, but has been brought into a bit starker contrast over the past week with a trial going on down in El Paso, where a man felt that he was obeying the laws of God rather than men by shooting a lawyer to death. I really have trouble understanding how someone can imagine that the law of God calls for the death of anyone. The Prince of Peace calling for death I just can't go with. Now in my moments of anger and frustration I get where that ball of rage comes from but I'm reminded that we're called to do something better with it. 
We're called to find a different way forward. Even if we disagree with what someone is doing, there are better ways. There are ways that leave a path open for redemption. Even if he truly believed that this person was doing horrible things, death cuts off the path of redemption in this life. Because I believe in a God who is stronger than death, I believe that the path of redemption is still open in the next. I believe that God never stops chasing after us. That is the God that I believe in. That is the God that I trust and I hope. That is the God that I give what I can find to. That is the God that I find has a stamp over everything. A God that says, if you don't think that there is justice, see what I can do. And yes, I despair sometimes and I grit my teeth that God's sense of timing on justice does not come through as fast as I would like. Karma works way too slow. And sometimes I think I might, be, might like to be an agent of karma. But I know that that would get me in trouble. We look at that which is within our hands and within our reach, and we ask, what is it that belongs to the empire of death? What is it that belongs to the kingdom of life? How can we invest more in the kingdom of life, in the community of hope, in the community in which we'd more like to live? And how can we call to account all of the institutions, those that call themselves by God's name and those which call themselves by Caesar's name? How can we call all of them to greater account to be better than they were yesterday? How can we call all of us, because we are all involved in this, after all, one of our founding documents in this country starts out, starts out, we, the people. And if we are to be we, the people, within our nation and within our community of faith, then we must be more involved, not less. We cannot just let Caesar do what Caesar will do and wash our hands of it but rather call Caesar and all the tiny little Caesars to redemption, to something better, even as we recognize that we ourselves find a place within that same call to be better today than we were yesterday, and with hope, even better tomorrow. Let's pray. Gracious God, for the opportunity to discern what should be yours, we give you thanks. When we find ourselves in those difficult moments, we ask for your wisdom, your guidance, and your strength. We ask for your spirit to work within us for perseverance when the time seems oh so long, when we seem to be without any spoons to get done what you would have us do. So help us this day to bear your image more truly, to see your image within each other, and to see their own images so that we are not just too focused on you. We don't notice what makes our neighbor truly our neighbor. 
Bind us to your vision of our unity, of our humanity, of us as your children. In this we pray. Amen.